Hi, my name is Jordan Wilson. Today we're going to continue with the passive versus active management debate. And we're going to look at a little bit of empirical evidence. If you recall, when we started our look at passive investing and active investing, we saw that passive, you're just investing in the market. You're a passive shareholder. So your goal is to try to replicate the market return. You want to match the market. And because of that, you want to focus on minimizing your costs. And as a passive investor, you probably have minimal trades that keeps your costs down. Plus you're only adjusting your portfolio if the index benchmark that you're following adjusts itself, if you have a new stock coming in and another stock leaving, or maybe the market weights change a bit. But you're just sitting there, I'm buying the index, and that's it. An active manager, on the other hand, is jumping around. They're using fundamental or technical analysis. They're implementing strategies and short-term tactics to try to get an edge. They're market timing. And in the example that I tend to use is the S&P 500. Now the S&P 500 is made up of growth stocks, value stocks, big stocks, slightly smaller stocks, healthcare, high tech, defensive, every type of stock basically. If I'm a passive investor, I'm just buying all those roughly 500 shares in their appropriate weights and that's it. If I'm an active manager, I'm saying, okay, you know, out of those 500 stocks, there's a hundred that are just garbage. I'm not going to buy those at all. And just by that, I should be able to outperform the market because the 100 shares would have been dragging down the results for the rest of the market. Or I could be saying, you know, we're going into recession. It's time to get rid of the growth stocks in the S&P 500 and shift that money into defensive stocks or value stocks. So intuitively, active management should work. Intuitively. So let's take a look at maybe some of the evidence out there. And this will not be exhaustive because we're not here to do a finance 1000 course at a university. It's more just, let's make a few points. So the case for active management. The first study that I cite here, and there's a lot of studies out there that are pro and con. I just kind of picked two on each side, to sort of give you a flavor of what you might see if you look yourself. So in 2006, Kozowski, Timmerman, Wormers, White issued a study in the Journal of Finance that said, can mutual fund stars really pick stocks? New evidence from a bootstrap analysis. They looked at almost 2000 US equity funds between 1975 and 2002. Now, one of the points I'd like to make here is a general finance point, maybe a rant, I don't know. If you are looking at studies for anything in investing or finance, you want to find studies that have significant sample sizes and long time periods. Now, maybe 2000 mutual funds is a little low, but you know, it's decent size. And here you've got, what is it, 27 years. What you see is a lot of studies cherry pick in sample size, maybe very low numbers or very short time periods. And I could show you many examples that if you cut off something at a certain point in time to either start your analysis or end your analysis, you can achieve completely different results than if you just extended it a couple of years on either side. So I think some people in their studies, they know what they want for an answer, 
and then they work backwards to find the data to support that. So here, the more you can find in a sample and the longer the time period, the less manipulation can be done. Anyways, what uh, Kosofsky and crew found was that over that time period, there were more top performing fund managers than would be expected just by luck or chance. They also found that those that had better results continued to have better results in future time periods. And they concluded that certain managers have superior skills. It's not just luck. And that kind of goes against sort of what I was saying previously about it's tough to consistently outperform the benchmarks over time. So here they're saying, okay, in our time period, we think you can. That's a pro for active management. If we turn to Jane Lee of FunQuest, in 2010, she issued when active management shines versus passive, examining real alpha in five full market cycles over the past 30 years. Here we've got 32,000 mutual funds in 73 different categories, covering 30 years and five full market cycles. And again, when we talked a bit about fund managers, when you're assessing them, I had said that if you have the chance, you want to see how they did in, you know, at least a couple of bull, a couple of bear markets. So anyone can do relatively well in a up market. The rising tide floats all boats. But how do you do in a down market or a stagnant market? So this covering the 30 years in multiple market cycles should give her a decent idea of the performance or outperformance. And I think what she found was that active managers do outperform the passive benchmark in a bull market. And that makes sense for a few reasons. One of them is that growth stocks, which do well in bull markets, they tend to be decent flyers. So if you can identify a bull market and allocate your money into growth stocks, then the passive people are still dragging with the value or the defensive stocks from the uh, index. What she found as well, though, is that in a bear market, the active managers were not very good at identifying superior performing assets. And I think a part of that was probably more the inability to time when a down market started and when it ended. And that's a fundamental issue in market timing is, can I guess when the downturn is going to start or when it's going to end? In fixed income, she did find some outperformance, even in bear markets. And again, to me, that's not a surprising result. Her conclusions, the longer a manager is in that fund management position, the better the chance of success. And again, that's, uh, to me, something that does make sense. If I have a underperforming manager in a fund, they're probably going to boot him or her out sooner rather than later. Whereas the better performer is going to be rewarded and stick around. So that makes sense. The second thing, and we'll see this over and over and over and over, is your lower the expense in your fund. So the management expense ratio, the MER, the greater the probability of outperformance. The greater the costs, the harder it is to achieve superior performance on a net basis. And we talked about this before, we'll talk about this again. Lower costs are better. Third, she found that the lower volatility of a portfolio 
And that's when we talked about standard deviation. So the less risky the portfolio, the better the chance of fund manager success. And for some people that might seem counterintuitive because you would think that the investment professionals should do better picking the higher risk stocks and assets. Whereas what she found was the opposite. They do better when it's lower risk. So that would be say the blue chip stocks or the good quality bonds. And they don't do quite as well in the riskier areas. And yeah, not quite sure I agree with that, but that's what she found. And her final point was that if you experienced outperformance in a previous market cycle, there's going to be a greater probability that you'll achieve outperformance in the next cycle. And that kind of meshes nicely with what Kozowski and crew found above is that better results continued in future periods. So there's a bit of consistency there, which is good. So that's kind of two examples of the case for active management. And in Lee's instance, it's not all the time, but uh, there is some. I picked two studies in the case against active management which would be, I guess, a case for passive investing. The first one is by Burton Melkiel, Reflections on the Efficient Market Hypothesis 30 Years Later. And to think I read these things for a living. Anyways, this is from 2005. He found that over short periods, there could be some actively managed outperformance, but that there was no consistency of that performance continuing in the long run. And that runs a little bit contrary to what we just saw in the prior with Koslowski and Lee. So there's a little bit of discrepancy One thing he did find, which was interesting, is that in 2003, 73% of the actively managed large cap equity funds had after expense returns, so net returns, lower than the S&P 500. And if we're talking US large cap equity funds, the S&P is probably a decent comparable benchmark. So 73% underperformed in that one year. For periods longer than 10 years, he found that more than 80% of the funds failed to meet this benchmark. And he found that returns from all equity mutual funds indicated that actively managed funds underperformed index funds by more than 200 basis points that's 2%, over 10 and 20 years. And his conclusion was that the weaker performance of the active funds was primarily, if not totally, the result of higher expenses and trading costs. And that's kind of what Lee said before, is that the outperformance of the active managers was often correlated to the funds with the lower, lowest costs. So even though they come to different conclusions, you see that connection on management expense ratios. So that's, I think, an interesting thing. But again, it's incredible that 73% in a single year underperformed their benchmark and 80% over 10 years underperformed. That's not a lot of alpha. If we turn to Barris, Scalit, and Wormers makes another appearance. 
from 2005. False discoveries in mutual fund performance, measuring luck in estimated alphas. Now, what they look at is about 1,500 US equity funds. And again, that's between 75 and 2002. They found that 76.6% had no alpha and 21.3% additionally were to the far left of the bell curve. And that only 2.1% of the funds that they looked at achieved alpha over time. So again, that's kind of in line with what Melchiel talked about is over a longer period, 80% didn't meet their benchmark. Here, these folks are finding similar, very little. 2.1% of the reviewed funds demonstrated that managers outperformed the markets based on skill. So that's, again, not a uh, glowing endorsement of the active management. But those are just two studies on either side. You can go out, look at your own information and there's always new studies and one says one thing, the other says something else. And as the market conditions change, you see one shine for a period, the other not. And I wanna close with just basically, not necessarily my own thoughts, but just some actual data and a few comments from me on this. So this is June 28, 2019. So a year, year and a half ago. Morningstar, good folks at Morningstar. What they're looking at here is the active funds success rates by category. So we talked before about mutual funds and how they go into different categories and you wanna compare apples to apples. I don't want to compare U.S. large blend stocks to U.S. small growth stocks. It's a different risk return profile. And that's why you have the different categorizations. You compare like funds in the same category to assess relative performance. But what we find here, just some interesting points, is that if we look in year one and the data here shows in percent the percentage of funds in a specific class that outperforms its benchmark on a net basis obviously and what we find if we look at u.s large blend is that one year performance 32 percent of the funds outperform their benchmark 68% roughly underperform. So maybe you can find the 32% that did well, but then, and I talked about this as well before, and that's why I pointed out, is suddenly we look at the five year and the 10 year and the 15 year. There's a huge drop off in the ability to outperform your benchmark, to achieve alpha, as we talked about. And that gets back to, it is difficult. Passive investors think impossible for asset managers to consistently pick winners over long time periods. And again, if we go down this chart and this is u.s funds you don't see a whole heck of a lot of asset classes where over the long haul they achieve substantial outperformance so i think one of the takeaways here is for most of the asset classes is as time increases in this study 
the outperformance ability falls. That's the same if we look at US large growth. In one year, they do 54% outperform their benchmark. By 15 years, it's down to 12%. US small blend, 45% down to 19%. World large stock, 55% in one year down to 28. Now, the other thing I kind of said was that in neglected niche or markets where maybe the information flow isn't as developed as the North American markets, that might give asset managers the ability to still be agile and nimble. Now, if we look at the foreign small mid blend, so those are sort of smaller international companies, and we see that in one year, yeah, it's only 34% outperformance, but over sort of the 10 year period, the managers have achieved some success. Another point I'd like to make here, which I'll make elsewhere as well, but what you will find in general is that there often is an ability for active managers to outperform in the fixed income classes. And what we're seeing here, again, if we go to the bottom of that chart, intermediate core, corporate bonds, high yield bonds, not great for the intermediate core, but on the corporate bonds, which again are a little bit more risky than government bonds, and the high yield bonds, which are definitely on the higher end of the fixed income risk spectrum, we are seeing some outperformance over the longer terms. And that's why I said when we we're looking at uh, one of the earlier studies on how asset managers could outperform on low volatility investments. That kind of surprised me because in my view, that's where asset managers do well is in the higher risk and especially on the fixed income side and higher risk on the international side. So I think if I'm a emerging market or as I said, a foreign small mid blend stock, those are gonna have higher standard deviations, higher risk, higher volatility. And I do think that asset managers in those areas can provide some outperformance. The counter to that is as we talked about, is that the more niche or the less information out there for an investment market, say foreign small mid blends, that requires more work by the asset manager to track down individual investments. The more work is the more cost. The more cost means the lower that your net return is going to be, which means that you need to outperform even more to beat your benchmark. But to me, this is an interesting graph and there's so many of these graphs out there that you can track down. But Essentially, in the 15 year category, or let's do the 10 because everyone's filled in there. In the US large market, and that's equities, they don't even hit 10% of their mutual funds beat the S&P 500 over a 10 year basis. So why the heck am I paying one and a half to 2% in fees when I only have a one in 10 chance of beating my benchmark on a consistent basis over time. Similar in the US mid cap and the small cap, you know, over 10 years, you're looking at two thirds of the funds are going to underperform. Foreign large blend, foreign large value, two thirds underperform. World, large stock, two-thirds underperform. 
U.S. real estate, global real estate, two-thirds underperform. There's not many areas that you can proudly stick your hand up if you're an active manager and say, we consistently beat the markets. So, interesting slide. And I think the other point I'd make, it's not listed here, but Morningstar makes it in the report that I pilfered this chart from, is that in their passive active barometer that they put out periodically, the big finding is cost matters and that fees are one of the biggest predictors of future fund performance. And they found that the failure to outperform in this chart, especially over the longer time horizons, is positively correlated with fees. And by that they mean that the higher cost funds are more likely to underperform or be shuttered or merged away. And we talked about that in survivorship bias. While lower cost funds were more likely to survive and enjoy greater odds of success. So fees are a huge predictor indicator of future success in a fund. And to me, that means, okay, maybe I'm looking at an iShares ETF with 10, 12, 15 basis points in fees and expenses instead of the RBC fund that I've been hammering for the last few sessions at 1.89 if I'm a low volume investor. And we saw that when I did compare, I think an iShares TSX 300 comp or cap composite ETF versus the RBC Canadian equity, huge relative outperformance by the low cost index fund over the actively managed equity fund. So again, just some interesting data and it's just data. You're not looking at, you know, cherry picking. It's just, this is, this is what it is. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed that. I love that analysis and seeing actual hard numbers and coming to the conclusions. So again, in certain instances, maybe active can add value overall very iffy and i think next time or in the following session after next time we'll look at some of the areas where i think that active management might be useful thank you very much for your time today have yourself a good one